everyone, uh, my name is Rishabh and uh, I'll uh, assume that uh, everyone present in this room is a student and uh, this is your first day of, uh, of your uh, schooling in design and so you're quite excited about how I'm going to be teaching and what I'm going to be teaching. So a um, little bit about myself, uh, I've been teaching um, fashion since 97. Uh, and very, very passionate about uh, art and design. Uh, graduated from Pearl Academy back in 98 and then went to UK to study uh, at St. Martin's, which is my dream, uh, and worked there for uh, just over 10 years, and then came back to India and joined Pearl Academy where I got my initial training. Um, I was in Pearl Academy for two years, and then I came to Delhi and joined Modern Art International. It's a French institute. Uh, has two franchises in India. One is in Mumbai and one is uh, in Delhi. I'm the HRD at the Delhi branch. Um, firstly, I'd just like to welcome all of you um, to your new course. It's, uh, it's a fantastic time that you've joined this course. The 21st century has opened up to design so much and we are living in very happy times. Uh, parents are more open about students joining fashion it's a, it's a very creative field and uh, people don't look down upon uh, fashion designers as just tailors so it's fantastic and it's very challenging because I think everyone wants to look good in today's day and age it's very important uh, and fashion has become so affordable these days uh, retail outlet, outlets like uh, Big Bazaar, Reliance uh, they have made fashion so affordable and uh, everyone wants to be smart and attractive. It uh, it uh, really reflects your personality, what you wear. Of course, uh, what is more important is uh, how much knowledge you have, and of course, in the long run, that is more important. But uh, appearances are just as important. So anyway, um, coming back to my um, uh, presentation today, um, I can take a, a few subjects, uh, but I enjoy. Um, the history of Western costume, uh, amongst other subject design and illustration, which I enjoy the most. So I've done a presentation on uh, the history of Western costume, and I've chosen uh, randomly. I've chosen the 20th century uh, to discuss. Uh, the 20th century happens to be uh, one of the most uh, important uh, 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 times in fashion because uh, in this particular century, most of the most profound uh, changes came about, especially. Uh, with the liberation for women and their freedom to speak, to work. Um, some of the best designers also uh, came about in the 20th century. Uh, Dior um, and uh, Norman Hartnell and Poiré to mention. Um, I'll start my, I don't have a PPT, uh, but I just put together a few uh, images so we can, uh, we can probably go through them. One by one, I'll just begin with the beginning of the 20th century, which is the 1900s. And uh, as you can see, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, extravagance was the overall mood of the society, and Paris uh, was considered to be the, the mecca of fashion, uh, basically. You know, uh, America and Britain were like little kids, um, um, you know, waiting for Paris to launch the latest uh, designs, the trends, and uh, they used to follow. Uh, <clears throat> um, traditional clothing, uh, uh, conservative clothing was uh, uh, acceptable in Paris in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, ground length dresses, as you can see here, uh, full length. Um, uh, women uh, were considered very respectable if they wore brown linen. In fact, if a woman showed her ankles, she was considered quite characterless in those times. And so you can see here, uh, women are wearing um, full dresses, um, uh, rather elaborate. Uh, and that's a lovely picture here. And they were all considered, uh, they were all uh, expected to wear hats. This respectable woman always uh, wore a hat when she stepped out of the house. Um, in 1906, uh, this lovely lady here called uh, Queen Alexandra, uh, when she was uh, coronated as the Queen of England, um, she decided that you know we always go to Paris to do our shopping and you know all of that so she decided that London should also come onto the fashion map and so uh, Queen Alexandra was the one of the pioneers 
who decided that she would only shop in uh, uh, London, and that is why London also became a fashion metropolis uh, from uh, henceforth. Um, wearing a corset uh, was considered very, uh, very fascinating in those days. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, you know, why a person made a corset uh, to begin with, but it was considered to be the underwear of those times. Uh, women these days, girls, uh, wear a chemise or a slip, but in those days, a corset was considered very, very appropriate, especially when a woman had to go for an evening ball. Uh, it was basically cons uh, meant to uh, slim them down their body and especially um, in France where food is considered so important the best chef will be very uh, very uh, fascinated to know that the best chefs in uh, the world come from France and so uh, they love eating and they love eating fantastic foods and probably you've had some uh, French food uh, you know ever before uh, but they like eating cheeses and their wines are lovely and they have several courses of uh, um, dinners and lunches so obviously these women were always eating the whole day and obviously when they had to go for a party they wanted to look beautiful and slim so this corset uh, was uh, designed for them and basically this is a uh, this I'm not very technical with uh, that making in GC, but I know it's. I've seen a corset before, so it's a, uh, it's a uh, like a wrap, and it has bonings. You'll be very fascinated to know that a corset actually has whale bonings. Uh, it used to have whale bonings uh, until the time that uh, the Animal Protection Act uh, stopped the use of bonings in corsets. So um, these women used to wear these corsets, and uh, it was very difficult for them to fit into the corset. So they used to have maids who used to help them, and you've probably seen it in in Titanic or uh, or some you know period films um, uh, where women are trying the corset on. So they used to fit into this corset, and uh, of course it had a lot of uh, side effects uh, to the health of a woman also, um, because what happened basically is the corset really tightened up the uh, the, the, the belly and the stomach uh, and so the fat of this area had to go somewhere so half of it basically came up and half of it went down which made the bust and the hip look very big and this is uh, iconically the, the silhouette of the beginning of the 1900s uh, this uh, a big bust in the hip uh, made this fantastic silhouette you've probably seen it the, the, the back was quite uh, exaggerated uh, but um, very soon, uh, a great designer called, um, sorry, just, it's very long, this uh, uh, Paul Poiret, he understood the torture that the women had to go through and he made a longer corset. He made a corset that was mid-thigh, which, uh, which aimed at benefiting uh, women. Because, because of this longer corset, what happened is that the bust, the belly and the hip all got squeezed into the corset, making this uh, new new fantastic silhouette called the slimline silhouette uh, around the 1908s and 10s um, and this became very very popular um, with the women in 1914 world war one broke out no one was really ready for a war at this time so the slimline silhouette didn't really have a, a very long life uh, and, and the world war one was a, a quite a shock uh, for everyone especially the women all the men brothers fathers they had to go to work and which meant the women had to uh, uh, support the family and start working in here we're talking about uh, the middle middle uh, class women and so um, so the first thing that uh, we see in the 20th century which is rather fantastic is uh, the length of the gown it uh, shortened it decreased from a ground length to a uh, ankle length and um, for the first time in the history of costume, it was acceptable for women to show their ankles, which was absolutely fantastic. And of course, the silhouette of the gown also changed from a slim line to an A line, because women wanted to work and they wanted to be comfortable when they worked. Um, so you can see here, this uh, woman is wearing this lovely gown, a uh, working gown, and you can see the ankles of the lady also. These are some of the... Uh, wartime fashions of uh, uh, First World War, where women are wearing comfortable clothing. It wasn't uh, too fitted. They were not uh, expected to wear corsets anymore. 
Um, also, something that really uh, was fantastic that came out of the war was the uh, making of clothes uh, in, in mass production. Uh, before this, uh, tailor-made clothes were made especially uh, for the uh, clients, and mass production came about in the First World War. Women uh, took to mass production in a very good way, and uh, just like uniforms, clothes now were made in you know selected sizes. You could go to a store and just buy a small, medium, large, or extra large, and which was fantastic. In case I'm going um, too fast, you can slow me down, or if you want me to repeat anything, that is fine. Okay, Rishabh, I think we are about to see ah, okay. what you are trying to say here. Uh, one thing that uh, confuses me in your CD is uh, it says that you have been associate uh, professor evening course at NIFT. Yes, yes, I lecture at NIFT uh, for the postgraduate program in the continuing education department, sort of a thing that they've started now. Yeah, the bridging. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And also, then uh, during the day, you were working with Molana. Yes, that's right. And uh, you also say uh, you introduced yourself that you were very uh, good with design. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Do you have some of your work of illustration? Ah, I don't, I don't. I'm very sorry, but I can always send it to you. Uh, I have an online portfolio, um, but if this gentleman here can help me with that, um, if you, or if you want to see it. And uh, what about design? I'm, um, uh, design is uh, one of my core subjects, just like, uh, just, just like um, history. I think uh, I help students to conceptualize, and I think uh, the synopsis of the program, um, maybe, uh, whether is it, it is a one year, two year, or three years, is the, the, you know, coming up with a great idea to begin with in your mind, and then to put it on paper, give it a 2D shape, to draw it, and then to be able to give it a 3D shape and make it, is the entire design process. Now I also think the work of the designer doesn't end there. It's uh, coming up with a great idea, putting it on paper, making the garment, and then being able to sell it also to the most appropriate market for the most appropriate price. So uh, all designers, I think, in today's day and age need to be good uh, uh, you know, sellers as well. They must be able to sell their product. There's no use you're making such a fantastic design and just keeping it in your showroom if it doesn't sell. So you need to know the client profile. So this whole process is what the course is all about and in this course I think there are so many subjects that help uh, understand like textile, uh, export and import, marketing, management, uh, surface ornamentation as we uh, discussed earlier. I help the students conceptualize and come up with great themes um, so that they can put something new on the table. I so think it's what is your design process or what is the process that you follow with the students? I think uh, for any design to be great, research is very important. I encourage my students to do a lot of research, not only just sit in front of the Google uh, and just type in a few words, take printouts and start you know, with their work. They must always be very alert and they must go to exhibitions uh, regardless of what the subject of the exhibit is. Some people only go for fashion weeks and they think we get very uh, you know uh, inspired by things. I say go to science museums, go to architectural uh, design, look at you know, the most un uh, uh, related inspirations for fashion. That's what makes a subject so interesting. There are such great designers like McQueen and Hussein Shalayan who have taken inspiration from architecture, science and technology. And there are such fantastic sources of inspiration that we can take. I don't know why students always, when I might give my students something to do, they only look at what other designers are doing and they're looking at you know, Armani and, and they copy and I want to draw something like this and I want to design something like this. And I, this, is, this is plagiarism and really you should stay away from it. So I always uh, encourage my students to do research is the foundation of any good work. And so that is very important. And something new, and I always tell them to go outside of India. We've, we've seen Bulgari, we've seen Thai and Dai, with all due respect to all the arts in India. But obviously when you are creating something new, you want to firstly get a lot of new ideas and, and enlighten yourself. And of course also educate the audience uh, who would be seeing your work. So, if I have to use 
uh, tell you this that uh, design for me is not uh, always about innovation. Uh, how much do you agree? Oh, I uh, absolutely agree. It depends on person to person. I think all. Uh, I think it's also a state of mind. I think um, you don't really have to be very innovative or or uh, 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 very designer, as they say, to look good. Uh, design uh, is all uh, very. Uh, uh, personal, uh, you cannot put your finger on one, uh, you know, art or design and say it's not beautiful. I think it's, it's like, it's like one man's meat is another man's poison. So, so what I might like, you know, it, it has so many different interpretations. So design really um, must tick some very important essential boxes. So do you think that the design is also about problem solving? It is, it is, absolutely. If there is a gap in the market, if there is a gap in the country for a particular kind of a design, then by all means that design will be considered successful. And, you know, there's, Louis Vuitton is making scarves for Dubai, um, which, uh, which women wear, the hijab, uh, and they are selling like hot cake over there, and they're doing so well. So it, it is, it is a solution for a problem also. Women in the Middle East are very conservative, but yet they want to look very smart. So they are wearing the Vuitton, you know, hijabs, uh, which is solving their problems and at the same time keeping them in the restraints of the cultural, you know, the, the society uh, as well. So it is uh, by all means, yes. How do you ask or tell your students to take the journey from inspiration to design? I mean, how I think they uh, take out elements from yes, inspiration yes. and put them into That's the right. design? That's right. So, so once they've done their initial research, I always say to them, you should taper down to one particular inspiration or theme. And once you've decided what you want to focus on, you, you really need to do a do a, like a 360 degree uh, analysis of that inspiration, try and pull out as many stories, which some people also call as brainstorming. Mm -hmm. And so you're looking at that inspiration from every possible angle and trying to draw stories just like a forecast, like a fashion forecast. They have themes, they have lovely themes. And so the student has to do that first and then show it in a atmosphere board or a mood board or an inspiration board and then you know carry on the research and then start developing ideas you know some styling they have to keep in mind the three most important you things experience using some example as when you're teaching your students how you tell them okay suppose this is an inspiration how to draw the elements that you would further put into your design so um i have been doing something which is called the white project for a very long time since uh, i came back from uh, uk uh, at st martin's the white project is the most important every year and the students that begin their course they start with the white project now why we do the white project right at the beginning is that they have to try and avoid color okay <laughs> and sorry to you you you're a master of color and yet uh, i'm saying they have to avoid color because so they can focus on silhouette and uh, the white project is something that they uh, color is very personal it makes them very personal and so assessment is very challenging when someone has no color and only white it's very difficult to work with colors it's very sorry it's very easy to work with colors but so difficult to work without color so students came up with fantastic themes in white and uh, they all had their own ideas i tell them to uh, to look at the three most important aspects of a design, color, fabric, and styling. And that's how they uh, start tapering down, you know, choosing the, um, the, the most important colors for the collection, styling, but it has to have a fantastic relationship with the inspiration also. Not a direct one, I always say, if it's more conceptual, then it's better. As opposed to, you know, taking a flower and just taking the shape of the flower as a silhouette. So conceptual is always uh, better. Uh, what is the difference between inspiration and theme recording? Ah, this is uh, something my students always get confused yeah. with. We are students. We are students. Yes, yes. I think inspiration is very personal. I think inspiration, uh, you can do so much with inspiration. You can change the colors. You can, you can say I'm inspired by a blue cow or I'm inspired by a yellow sky or inspired by, but a theme is more general. You, you know, give a theme to a group of students where something has to be common. There are themes in the forecast, like I said before, 
there are themes in a competition. You give there's a competition being held, and the theme is freedom. And then in that freedom theme, students can pick up an inspiration. Freedom can mean different things for different people. They can interpret freedom in so many different ways. Freedom for women, freedom for uh, African slaves that, that are taken to America, uh, freedom for um, uh, animals or that are being killed, slaughtered by these multi-brand um, uh, multi giants uh, across the world. So freedom is the theme. And then a student picks up an inspiration and interprets uh, what their ideas are, basically. The theme comes before inspiration. It's like the chicken and the egg, basically. You can't uh, really say what comes first. But uh, see, I, as I said, it's individual. If I were to just work with an inspiration, then I'd just do an inspiration. i talk about my inspiration. I think my inspiration is Matahari or Egypt. Uh, but if there's a group of people who need to be assessed uh, uh, in unison, then I'd give them a theme. The theme is light. Now, what does light mean for each one of you? Light can be black for someone or white for another person or or life for uh, a design, blind man. The design collection is based on, a, it should be based on a theme or on inspiration. Uh, I think designers should talk no, about students, students. Ah, students students uh, if they're doing individual work then they should talk about inspiration but if they are doing a group work then they should talk about themes so the, also uh, if uh, supposedly you have to teach design to the students what would you uh, motivate motivate them with them would it be lateral thinking or lateral thinking um always uh, Conceptual. I all. I believe in concepts. I believe in uh, uh, a conceptual interpretation of design rather than literal interpretation of designs. So, I think I think a good design is very well thought, and it is complex, and it has a story. But if you say my my inspiration is a glass, and you make a dress that is an A line like a glass put upside down, then that is very boring because that anybody can do. You go to a medical student or you go to a chef and they do the same thing, you know, glass. Ulta kari isko, dress ban gaya. But what is fantastic is if you, if you uh, change and you, and you have an idea, you have a story that you can tell people. A good design must start a debate, I think. Uh, if someone can point a finger and say, what is that? and I don't understand it, that means somewhere you have been successful in, uh, in coming up with a good design. And, um, and if someone just passes your work and says, you know, I've seen this before, and there's nothing great about it. I mean, there's nothing as insulting as that, I think, for a designer to have made something that has been done before. So design has to be complex, and it has to be... Uh, and having said all of this, it has to be understandable also. I don't mean it has to be very, very you know, difficult to understand. So, uh, here you are saying that it can be complex, cannot be simple. Yes, yes. Uh, simple in appearance maybe, but complex in the idea. Just like a painting. I mean, the Mona Lisa looks so simple and beautiful, but the idea behind the Mona Lisa, you know, like any artist, when they make a painting, it seems very ordinary and, you know, you have your father or your mother with you and they say, is me kya khas but what is important is when you read the idea of the artist, when you read the concept, the hidden concept uh, behind the creation, a simple line on a canvas uh, could be could be a scar, a, scar, a very deep scar in society, uh, you know, and the and the position of women in India these days, and the hidden idea, the, the meaning between the lines is what makes all the difference. Uh, can we see your illustration? Yes. Um, I'm not sure how I how I can access my uh, files. They are on the drive, the Google Drive, and something.
You need I to go to your Google account, Gmail account, and ah, get some Gmail. Data. Yes, Gmail. That's right. And then they have Google Photos. And I okay, have, what we'll uh, I have we'll uploaded my the photo session here, and maybe you can mail it to me. Yes, I can, I can send you the link, and you can just open it directly from your laptop and see the whole. Yeah, Google. you have my number, so you yes. can. Uh, yes, I'll do that. I'll yeah. do that. All right. All right. Thank you, Rishabh. Uh, Thanks for listening. Yeah.